every year at this time, everyone on the eastern seaboard who knows anything about snowboarding shows up for the U.S. Open Halfpipe. We're expecting crowds of up to 10,000 people here today. This thing goes off. It's the biggest snowboard competition in the world. The Opens through the 90s were definitely, they could get out of control. People had kegs going on the side of, of the pipe. People lined up drinking and screaming. I think one of the top highlights from any of the Opens is the cage. Everyone talks about the cage. Some years people would bring fencing and, and make their own little beer cage that only their crew could be in. It was crazy. Pat Bridges, uh, Mark Sullivan, all those guys, they built this like sketchy chicken wire cage with like two by fours that was not up to code for sure. And they pretty much just got wasted all day and cheered on snowboarding. It was sick. <laughs> So we get up at 5 in the morning, we go up to uh, the bottom of the pipe and we start dragging these 2x4s and all this chicken wire up there. Then this guy comes up on a snowmobile and this is where I think it's all going to come to an end and this guy's like, hey what are you guys doing? And we're like, oh we're creating a private viewing area for Burton employees and the guy's like, oh really? Can I get you anything? You guys need some trash barrels, some chairs, some tables and we're like, we need all of the above. And my friends and I had absolutely no idea what was going on. We saw that there was a bouncer letting people in and out. People were partying in it. And it was just all out mayhem. If you walked up the left side of the pipe during the open, during the contest, you were probably gonna drink like one or two beers every, every run. You were gonna stop, say hello to a bunch of locals and friends and everybody was partying. And if you needed a break from that, you'd walk up the right side, you know, which I never did. But it's a serious event, but at the same time, you're partying with the crowd and you're, you're partying with the other competitors. And um, yeah, left wall. But there would be dudes hanging out of the cage going, Roche, get over here. <laughs> trying to drag you in. Have a drink. And you're trying to do your runs. There are so many people in there that the, uh, the cage just broke and the, where people were standing on the back side fell off the, off the half pipe. I was thinking that these 60 people on chicken wire were going to fly down and take down 3,000 people. Didn't happen, thank God, and nobody got hurt. I mean, there were some incidents. Pat's one of the greatest snowboarders in the world and Pat did eggplants and his weird hand plant variations in that pipe, trashed, wearing wearing a tiger costume. And it's hard enough to walk down the road wearing a tiger costume drunk. And he was, he was rolling in from the deck doing inverts in that costume. And that's just, that's just mind boggling. Those are the moments that you can't script. You know, people going like, we're going to the open, like let's fill in the blank. Like let's throw up a cage and get some costumes and, and bring in, you know, stacks of beer and, and just go for it, you know, I mean, why not? And just to see this whole thing unfold, I mean, I think it's a really big part as to why I kept snowboarding, because I just wanted to constantly feel that excited about something. They just went up and acted like they owned the place and created this thing, and nobody asked them to take it down. That, I think, was one of the higher points of, of participation from a crowd standpoint. It was symbolic of the freedom that, that you had as a spectator at the event. The open doesn't belong to the sponsors, doesn't belong to Stratton. It, it belongs to the people that have come year after year after year. That's those 5,000 people that came for between, you know, the second they started doing pipe and the end of that next decade, basically. Yeah, it was uh, hilarious. People, you know, climbing up in trees, snowball fights, a lot of drinking on the side, you know, and a lot of cheering, a lot of shit talking. It, it was sick. It was, it was like, you wanted to ride to please the crowd there, you know? You wanted to be up over the crowd looking down and people going, yeah. You know, that I, I think that really ups the level of every competitor. And that's kind of the legacy of the US Open and started by, you know, Jeff Brushy back in the day, I think in 1990, you know, he came onto the scene and, and just started doing big airs. Brushy was just throwing out the illest trails and just like, boning it out and it was just like that vibe of of like this is snowboarding you know there's no rules you know i rode with brushy a lot and obviously you know he went the biggest at the time and you know i was really influenced by craig so i was just gonna like my philosophy if i can be as technical as craig at the time and go as big as brush and palmer i would do pretty good we didn't see terrier at the open as a superstar 
when he came, he was definitely one of the up and coming Groms, but you know, he didn't roll right in and win. You know, it, it took a few years. <laughs> Was there a little bit of a grudge match going on? You came in second to Terry Hawkinson at the Worlds at South Lake Tahoe, and today you squeezed him by three tenths of a point. The only grudge match between Hawkins is because he blasted me in the face with champagne at the Worlds, and he ran away from me, and I couldn't get him back. No, there's no grudge match there. The only thing that that kid just pushes me, just pushes me super hard. His last run was probably one of the most diverse runs I've seen him do in a long time, and it's it's rad to see that. All like the guys I looked up to, they were really cool to me, but I know there's a lot of hate from other guys and I could totally feel it. Uh, <laughs> Jimmy Scott was a pretty good example, but he's really trying to psych out that every, every new came out, not only me, but everybody else, you know. But then you have like Palmer and Brushy kind of like helping you to gain some psychological power against him. Like Palmer always told me like, when Jimmy drops, you just drop right after him and go twice as big as him. <laughs> he always used to tell me that, and like, Jimmy would drop in and Palmer would drop, and I would drop in. <laughs> you know, I think that probably my best uh, Terry A moment at the Open was when I first saw the sticker, the bootleg sticker that said, I saw Terry A go fucking huge at the US Open. It was just, it was great. Terry A really changed the whole thing. I think he made it more fun and more exciting for spectators and everybody. You know, he came in and he improved everyone, you know, and he was one of those riders that everyone started to copy. Because not only could he go big, but he was also doing very technical tricks and really pushed the direction to, to where it is today. Because at that time, he was like this god. Like, we didn't really know much about him. We just knew that, like, one day we wanted to be like him. And we kind of like snuck up from behind and we just literally like, just like touched him. And then like he'd turn around, look around, we'd kind of be like there, like, what? I don't know, like give him a weird look. And then he'd turn around again, and then the next person in the crew would go up and just be like, touch. And then we left and it was like, that was US Open 1998. There's a few photos that really jump out to me that when I think of all the pictures I took at the Open. Um, one definitely is uh, Terrier. We used to do this autograph session in this, this like courtyard at the open. And I mean, it would be mayhem. There'd be five, 600 people in this courtyard. And there's that big kind of clock tower hotel where all the riders would, would stay and they would congregate up on the top floor. And Hawkinson was on like the fifth story and he opens up his window and he had his board, you know, that he just won the pipe with and he's dangling it out the window and he threw the board out the window. Dude, it was, it, was, it was like a riot. And then there's a fight. People are going after the board. And I'm surprised someone didn't get killed. Every cop from down that area was called in because people were just beating on each other trying to grab Hawkinson's board. And that, was, that, was, that got ugly. And that's where whew, like, there were certain things that uh, certain rules got put in place. You had this convergence that was a pretty rowdy, snowboard only, not made for TV event. It was for the snowboarding industry, and that was pure. I mean, it was easy to see what the importance of the US Open was because it was the Olympics for freestyle snowboarding before there was an Olympics. It was the X Games for freestyle snowboarding before there was an X Games, and because it really was universal. You would get everybody of relevance who had a place of prominence within freestyle snowboarding was there. At that point, it was you're, you're getting to see a, a like bigger international field. You know, we weren't as it wasn't on television as much on the web, all that stuff. So people would come out to see these like Finnish or you know crazy Japanese riders that you'd maybe heard about but never seen. And so I feel like there's a lot of firsts at the here, Open. Here comes the first hit of oh, put that down smooth. I won two time US Open in 2010 to 2011. After that, it's uh, so much better with my snowboarding. <laughs> yeah, everything is so free and uh, yeah, it's so much fun. <laughs> 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 the Japanese are awesome. 